Okay, good afternoon and welcome to our Timony webinar this week on managing the new normal. My name is Ronan O'Farrell and I'm the CEO of the Timony Leadership Institute, which is an associate business school of Yesse Business School. A key purpose of our institute is to help leaders flourish in their roles, building sustainable organizations and a better society for all. Our guest on the webinar today is a passionate advocate for a more sustainable world, Professor Mike Rosenberg. He's an Associate Professor of Strategic Management at the SA Business School in Barcelona. He teaches in the MBA and Executive Education programs on strategy, sustainability, globalization, and geopolitics. And he has several books under his belt as well, dealing with environmental sustainability, geopolitics, and the future of the media industry. He's also the academic director for Enterprise Ireland's Leadership for Growth program, which YESA has been delivering for Enterprise Ireland for the past uh, four years. And we have several alumni of the program attending uh, the webinar today with us, and you're very welcome. Mike is, is no stranger himself to, to webinars like this, as he's been hosting uh, uh, most of, of the excellent series of webinars that uh, YESA has been providing over the past uh, three months for their 50,000 alumni around the world. Thanks, Mike, for, for joining us here in Ireland to talk to, uh, to our alumni of both YESA and uh, Timony programs. It's a privilege to, to have you with us. Good afternoon, Ronan. I, I've actually done, I think, about half of the webinars we've been doing, and we've we've actually been putting, putting them out uh, live on, on LinkedIn for anybody who wants to watch them, watch them. you know, anywhere in the world. We, we kind of thought it might, it's kind of like a public service we did during the emergency, but we are winding it down. I think right. we have a we have a few more left uh, in the next couple of weeks, and then and then in September we'll start something different. Very good, very good. Well, it was a great service. I must say, a lot of a lot of our, our alumni have tapped into it and found it found it very uplifting and encouraging, and insightful as well. So I presume at this stage you've you've been out for your your first drink in the new uh, the new uh, situation in Barcelona with the lockdown sort of lifted. Yeah, yeah. So, so Spain, uh, you know, as, as most of the uh, people watching the the, uh, the the broadcast know, Spain has been very hard hit by the virus. Um, it had uh, something like uh, twenty eight thousand fatalities, mm. and, and something like uh, two or three hundred thousand known cases. And, and of course, the known cases is just a fraction of the total cases because the known cases are the people who felt ill enough to go to the hospital and and, and get tested. You know, we don't know, you know, maybe 10 times that number actually had the virus. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the Spanish government declared a state of alarm, which is like a state of emergency. It's the first level of a national emergency uh, to kind of be able to enforce a very, very severe lockdown of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, at one point in time, you know, if you went out of your house without permission or going, you weren't going shopping, walking your dog or doing something uh, on the list, you can get a 600 euro fine just, just for being outside. Wow. You know, and... and, and if you do go shopping, you had to bring a receipt from the shopping. But if you forgot the shopping, you get it. Yeah. So it was, it was quite a significant lockdown, mm -hmm. and um, and that's over. That uh, we we went through a phased withdrawal, first phase one, phase two, phase. I think we're all in phase three now, and the official state of alarm ended on Monday. Now there are still a, a whole bunch of uh, protocols in place, um, but but the, but the life has come back. You yeah. Know? So if you go out for a coffee. Uh, there's, uh, you know, the terraces can only have 50% uh, of the tables and they have to be of a certain distance and they give you some gel to wash your hands. The waiters are all wearing masks. Um, restaurant owners are struggling because because their business models, of course, are made, you know, with all the tables they have. And yeah. if you cut the number of tables in half, then you have to figure out how to make money at less than half the tables and people are, are not even spending quite as much as they might have before the crisis. So it's a little bit complicated, but the good news is, is the world is back um and and it's it's nice to see that's yeah yeah it's great especially as the summer summer comes and i presume you're you're beginning to see some tourists reappear as well well the border i think the border's open uh, um I, I got to check but i think it's official on the first of july oh, first of july okay yeah okay. i live in a small town outside of barcelona close to the beach and and what we see is, is spanish tourism coming back mm -hmm. especially people from the city coming down to 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 get away from the city for a couple of days okay. and right uh rent a flat or something. Uh, but the, uh, the hope uh, and, and you know, the people I know in the restaurant business and the hotel business, they are desperately hoping that the tourists do come back in, in July. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's a lot, a lot of Irish people obviously travel to to Spain, but the the message here is very much about staycation and uh, staying at home at the moment. So, uh, be interesting. To yeah, see I mean, I, 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 as we were talking, I mean, I'm a bit surprised because because Ireland, you know, was uh, I mean, it was important and the impact was was important in Ireland, of course. And uh, but you guys are pretty much out of it by now. Your your number of cases is down below ten, if I understand the numbers properly, mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, at that level, uh, many other parts of the world are now opening up. You yeah. know, even before that, in Spain, we had I think 250 cases yesterday. You know, so so it, it's surprising that with such a few cases, Ireland is still uh, very very cautious. Yeah, yeah, and I think they they they're fearing the the return of it uh, in the autumn as well, and uh, and obviously trying to keep uh, keep the that to a minimum if they can. Hmm. But. Uh, just in, in light of the, the many hours of interviewing of faculty and executives that you've been doing, Mike, over these past few months, what do you think we will, uh, how will the, what will the world learn from this crisis, do you think? Well, that, that's, a, that's a great question, Ronan. And, and, and it's, you know, they say never let a good crisis go to waste. And uh, we, you know, we, we will hope that the world will learn a lot of lessons. I mean, I think the number one uh, lesson that I would hope that, that executives and managers all around learn is is to expect the unexpected, to, to build more resilient organizations and and not just to assume that tomorrow will be like yesterday. Mm -hmm. That you know business as usual is not the only scenario. There are you know other things might happen. There are uh, environmental issues which have plagued the world's uh, health issues as we found out, geopolitical issues, economic issues. And, and most business leaders never plan for anything besides good news. So I, I think the one, the, the first lesson I would hope people take away from is, okay, you know, let, let's plan for good news, but let's, let's have a plan B in case we get bad news. And let's try to imagine some of the scenarios which might evolve over time, which maybe are not so rosy and so, so beautiful as, as, as the ones we normally think about. And, and, and then think about what will we do if some of that stuff happens? You know, this, this requires some work, it requires some thought and some time, but it can be done. And, and largely people don't do that. Uh, that. That's one. I think another one is that uh, digital and digitalization can go much, much faster than I think anybody really imagined. You know, the fact that you guys are doing things online, we're doing things online, we're having this, this webinar. You know, all of us have figured out how to do stuff which we didn't know we could do. And, and this, I think, opens the gates for what else can we do? So that's, that's a lesson which I think uh, is, is clear. Uh, a third one, and, and, and I'll, maybe I'll stop after this one, which because I, I was really impressed by this. Uh, besides the public webinars, we've also been running um, breakfast meetings with the dean and, 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 and small groups of CEOs. And, and one of the CEOs um, from a very you know authentic and heartfelt point of view, he's a really tough, you know, famous guy, you know, take no prisoner kind of CEO type, uh, said that uh, he was amazed at some of the talent in his organization, which came out of nowhere, which he didn't expect, people he didn't even know, who done extraordinary, who had done extraordinary things during the crisis, and in fact he was questioning his own system of talent management and identifying talent and promoting people because a bunch of the cast of characters that he was relying upon kind of didn't do very much at all, and I think the this 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 uh, this wealth of unexpected talent. Um, I heard a story from an Irish company, uh, O'Neill's uh, Sporting Goods, you know, as they, they actually pivoted and started making scrubs in the emergency because sporting was, was you know, so uh, Mr. O'Neill was on, on, uh, on a program I do for, for Enterprise Ireland a couple of years ago and, and he had a fabulous manager, fabulous guy, beautiful human being. But, you know, in days, his company went from, you know, being the number one supplier of sporting goods to the number one supplier of medical scrubs. And now he's got a whole new business, which is the medical scrubs business. So, yeah. so I, I think you know these are the kinds of things which really fill us with, you know, fill me with uh, inspiration and and, uh, and hope for, for the future. Yeah, and in in some ways, just picking up on that point about talent, I mean, it, it sort of flattens organizations almost. I mean, we, we we say the you can't replace the the personal contact with the uh, with the digital, but one side effect is, you know, a lot more people, as you say, can appear with skills through the digital world in our organizations and show, show their talent uh, in and, that and, way. But I think on that, you know, I think the best leaders during this crisis have understood that they have to be communicating and over communicating mm -hmm. 
mm -hmm. at least compared to normal times with their people. And, 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 and I think the best ones have found mechanisms to do that, not only in terms of broadcast communication, like a town hall meeting when you talk to everybody, but also in, in, in finding moments of time to reach out to people and ask them how they are. Mm -hmm. uh, we had one executive in a, in a custom program that we're running uh, who, who spoke about during this, this period, she found time to speak to all of her direct reports, you know, offline, uh, online, of course, but, but out of the normal business meetings just to check on them and their families and to talk to them as people. And she said that this was extraordinary in her experience because even though she talked to many of these people all the time, you know, some of them she didn't even know that well yeah. in terms of the issues they have with family and children and, and, and situations in, 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 in out of work areas. And, and I think that there's this, this adding the human touch and actually caring about people, you know, which is, which is kind of obvious. And then to me, I don't need to tell you guys about it, but, yeah. but as, as a part of the responsibility of a leader, I think people were reminded of that uh, during the crisis. And, and some of them are, I think are going to try to keep that and carry that forward in, in, in the future and, and try to figure out how to make it, make it happen. Which is a really, really positive side effect of, of all of this, you know, which is, Absolutely. is great. Yeah. Well, you, you were mentioning in, in just building on that in one of your webinars that we're, we are sort of at a fork in the road, you know, between maybe a, it's simplistic perhaps, but a, an open, transparent, more collaborative world on the one hand, uh, and on the other, a drift towards protectionism, barriers, mistrust, even fear of privacy issues. Have you any sense which direction we're, we're so, going to go uh, in the coming year? I mean, I think we are in that fork of the road. I, I think the uh, mm. someone who put really, really beautiful words to that was uh, Noah Harari, the guy who wrote *Sapiens* and *Homo Deus*. Mm -hmm. he, he actually published a piece in the Financial Times in March, uh, talking about that fork in the road. And then, and you know, so on the one hand, you see, um, you know, the European governments at the beginning of this crisis, you know, every country going off its own own way. Um, and in the U.S., you know, the lack of, of federal leadership from the Trump administration has been uh, appalling, mm -hmm. you know, just, 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 you know, grossly criminal even. Um, and the states have had to go their own way, but sometimes with, with, you know, the White House going against what the states are doing. Anyway, you know, just crazy. Um, you've seen countries putting up walls and, and people being, you know, f afraid of each other. So this is, this is one side. And then, and then a whole set of solutions have to do with, um, you know, giving, uh, giving away privacy rights to know exactly where you are and, and having your phone trace your contacts and, 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 and using that whole kind of system to, to lock this thing down. But then on the other side, you know, the scientific collaboration from the very first days on this thing has been amazing, mm -hmm. extraordinary. The amount of solidarity of companies making masks and scrubs and putting together ventilators and, 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 you know, mm -hmm companies going the extra mile and neighbors going the extra mile to help each other. And, 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 and at this moment in time, you know, the European Union is finally talking to each other about when they're all going to open their borders up. You know, so, 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 so we've got these two currents about, you know, which way the world will go. Will this, will this crisis remind us all that we are part of the same global village and what happens in Wuhan does affect what happens in Dublin? Or will we say, no, no, it's a scary world out there. Let's lock, let's lock the door. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, my hope, of course, is that is that this will help steer us towards a better and more un, a, a more <laughs> comprehensive understanding of how fragile it is and how we have to work together. Um, but there are politicians in the world who are going to try to push us in the other direction. The other direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the the you were mentioning there even just about scenario planning and and being one of the lessons maybe that that we've learned from this that you need to plan for the uncertain. Like what, what implications do you think for leaders? Should they plan for both scenarios? Both? Absolutely. I mean, I mean, mm. the only, the only way to, 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 to really think about an uncertain future is through scenarios. Mm. You know, um, the, the biggest scenario that any, any executive in Ireland has to have is, is, is several different Brexit scenarios. Yeah. You know, still <laughs> how many years we've been talking about this thing. We still don't know exactly how it's going to look. That's right. You know, but, um, in, 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 in these kinds of terms, it seems, I think scenarios, it depends what business you're in, of course, and how, how, how closely it affects you. But uh, scenarios is the only way I know to really plan for very, very different futures. And it has to do with 
not trying to predict the future because I think that's more or less impossible, but but to imagine it and to imagine one future and to imagine another future and maybe even a third and then look at what you're doing and seeing how it would fare in those different scenarios. And sometimes you find that you have to do something yes or yes because in any scenario it's, it's true. And sometimes you, you find that this, you would only have to do if that happens, in which case you need to, to build some, some leading indicators to see, okay, when are we gonna know? So, so I think there's a whole methodology out there and, and it's, it's, it's well established, it's, it's available. Um, it's a little bit time consuming. Um, yeah. the, the other thing about scenario planning as, a, as an exercise with a senior management team though is, is even if the conversation isn't what happens later, just having the senior leadership team talk about different possibilities will make them more resilient and more able to deal with the unexpected when it does happen, whatever that is. So it's a good exercise in any case. Even, even as you say, in two weeks time, things change. Well, it's not going to have been wasted to have debated and trashed out those issues. And the yeah, you trash out the issues and then maybe in two weeks time or two years time or, 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 or 17 months time, you find that the something unexpected is happening. But yeah. the team now knows how to talk to each other about the unexpected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, which, is, which is different than saying, hey, everything has to be perfect. You know, every business plan is positive. Every curve goes up, you know, and tomorrow is always going to be better than today. Better. That's right. That's right. Well, just to say to people, actually, if you would like to ask a question to Mike, do pop it in the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen, and we will, we will try to get to those towards, towards the end. And uh, you can vote on those as well if they're ones that you think should be asked first. Um, but just building uh, on that earlier point you're making of some of the, the, the lessons we learned as well, I, I went back before um, preparing some of these questions to have a look at the video that you prepare, prepared in Yesse uh, at the end of the year, you know, where you look ahead to to the trends coming up in 2020. And of course, yeah, this, this was not on the list. This wasn't on the list. <laughs> no, but I was struck actually how, how quite a few of the themes have on maybe unwittingly or have, have played out, you know, things like, well, focus on purpose. Uh, a lot of people are, are reflecting on that now. Sustainability, we've seen, wow, what an amazing time from the point of view of, of uh, pressing pause on, on carbon consumption. Um, happiness, focus on that. That's certainly on a lot of people's minds too, having, having stepped back from the frenetic pace. Remote working trends. Oh, have you have you any sense now on what for the rest of the year where will the focus be? Will it switch to managing costs, survival, or do you think these will play out? Well, I mean, maybe we we, we open a different window to talk about the economic impact of this whole thing. But but in terms of some in terms of stepping back, I, I think what what many people at the individual level, at the corporate level, and and and, and even at the sector level are, are kind of thinking through is what will the normal the new normal look like and how much of the stuff that we've been doing over the last few months do we want to continue to do? You know, it's, maybe it's a silly example, but uh, I used to get my coffee, you know, or, uh, two blocks from my house, great coffee shop. During the emergency, when we were first allowed to walk, you know, we go for a long walk along the sea because we could, oh, this is wonderful. And uh, there's a coffee shop here. Now I'm walking, you know, 20 minutes more and I'm getting coffee in front of the sea, which is nicer. You know, and, and, and maybe, you know, in the new normal, I'm going to wake up 30 minutes early and do that every day just because mm -hmm. I can. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, you know, working from home, maybe not five days a week, but maybe two days a week. Uh, building into your schedule uh, one-on-ones with your direct reports to see how they're doing, you know, maybe once a month. I, th I think the real challenge for everybody will to figure out of all the stuff we've been doing differently because we had to, yep. what were the benefits of that stuff and what do we think we should keep as we go back to the world? And I think there's going to be a lot of interesting things that we're going to keep. Uh, so I think this is, this is one kind of, maybe it's a fuzzy trend, but it's a trend. Uh, the other one you mentioned is environmental sustainability. And, and, and we really don't know the answer yet. Mm -hmm. But the, you know, while, while on a global basis, this thing has killed almost half a million people um, and it caused you know, enormous economic damage. From the planet's point of view, it has been a godsend, both in terms of carbon and in terms of pollution, in terms of you know, uh, NOx in certain cities in the world, in terms of just just the air quality and the water quality. You know, this pause button has made 
the, 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 the earth itself has loved it. Mm -hmm. and, and many people are loving that. Uh, I, I was uh, talking to a group of former students and one of the women from uh, the Punjab. And from her village, you can see the Himalayas for the first time in 30 years. You know, this is, she's about 30 years old. She's never seen the mountains like this. And, and, she, and she's, she's amazed, you know, that she lives next to these majestic mountains. So, so just because the, of pollution. You know, just because of pollution. Now, this isn't climate change. This is, this is just air, air pollution. But the question is, Ronan, will the citizens of the world say, hey, we want more of this clean air, clean water, and why not? And if they do, you know, will they elect uh, politicians who will enact, in, you know, push in that direction? Uh, at the European Union, there's a, there's a huge debate about the stimulus package and linking the stimulus package to, to green projects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the American election will probably turn uh, to a large degree on the, the stark differences between Joe Biden and Donald Trump in terms of their own sustainability agenda, in terms of environmental sustainability. So there's this idea of a big green deal um, um, you know, could be part of our future, or maybe we just go back to normal and everybody's dropped in their cars and off we go. Um, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Well, that, that's where the, I suppose the economic in the short term and this, the six months ahead of us where there's probably a lot of economic pain to be played out. Uh, will that in some way push us back? It, it's, 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 hard to, it's hard to say, you know, the, when this thing first talked and, I, and I've interviewed, I think, three different economists uh, in three different webinars and they said of course three different things but the surprise the, i mean the what they've all more or less agreed upon is is the economic hit which is if you you know if you shut down a country like spain for three months and you turn off the restaurants and you turn off this and you turn off that you know you can almost list the sectors of the economy that you turn off and if you turn off half the economy for three months if you do the math you know that's 10 percent of gdp right there gone and that, and that money's gone it's not coming back tomorrow because you know those meals you're not going to go out twice yep. even if the restaurant's open you're not going to go out you know two friday nights in a row you're going to go out one friday night because because that's all you do right so so there's there's gonna there, you know there's not that much pent-up demand for some services now uh people might buy that car which they didn't buy for three months and they might buy this so so capital goods might come up mm -hmm. so will it be a v you know so we go down and then we go pop or will it be kind of like a long, painful L? And, and I think it really depends on, on country to country. It depends how long the, the impact was. It depends on what measures the government took. Sweden took much, much less measures than Spain. You know, so, so different places have, have had a different approach to, to, to handling this thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, but my guess is, is that people want to go out. People want to be in the world. People want to do the stuff that they do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as long as... Uh, demand comes back up supply will follow yeah 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 very good well the other other point you mentioned there uh, was about digitalization and i think we've all experienced uh, as you mentioned there the benefits of of it being fast forwarded for us particularly with remote working and so forth but do you see any any downsides to the increased digitalization there's a zillion downsides. There's a bunch of them. I mean, I mean, the the, the impact that that digital will may, may have on retail, on the high streets of the world. You know, because Amazon the, is loving it at the moment. Oh, I mean, everything online. You know, and you, and you look at the food delivery guys all over the place, and mm -hmm. and and basically everybody knows they can buy everything online. Mm -hmm. So I think this is going to be a tremendous challenge for for retailers to say, how do we get people back in the stores? How do we show people that coming back to the stores is worthwhile? that shopping is, is, is a better experience and it's safe. Um, and that's a better experience and you get better quality stuff or whatever. It's, it's difficult, huh? It's difficult as, as costs come down and as, as people realize that they can buy a lot of stuff online. So I think that's, that's, that's a specific challenge. But even in our own business, in our education business, we have that challenge, Ronan, which is, you know, people have learned that they can get content online. So, so we need to be very clear about what the added benefits of coming to class are. You know, and, 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 and those are spontaneous uh, discussions, talking with peers, and, and et cetera, et cetera. And then when we do go online, we have to make sure we can reproduce some of that stuff. You know, because if all of human knowledge is online for free, you know, yeah. why will people pay, you know, good money to come to ESA Business School or the Timini Institute? So we got to figure that out. Yeah. I, I think that, that that whole figuring out what is going to be valuable 
is a tremendously important trend. Um, and I think the last comment on digital is, is, is this whole digital privacy issue, which is, which is very, very real. And the, uh, you know, the big tech companies, you know, they're developing tremendously cool stuff for all of us, but they're not doing it in an altruistic way. They're doing it in order to capture more data about us in order to sell that data to other people. Yeah. I mean, this, this, is, this is what's called the surveillance capitalism by a woman at Harvard. And she's right. This, 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 this is the game. So, so will civil society allow that to happen or will civil society, you know, put some brakes on that? I think is another of the big issues of our time. Time, yeah, yeah, and and of course you have you have the. I mean, it relates some in some ways as a, a carrot there with the advantages of it in dealing with, for example, the pandemic, if it contact tracing and so on and so forth, but also with automation. You know that whole space that one of the ways this is spread, obviously, is being close contact and automating certain procedures avoids well, those yeah well, well I, I interviewed an executive at schneider electric who says their automation business is booming yeah and 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 you know if back in the day the issue was you know what is the cost benefit between automating production and having humans do it now there's an added uh safety and and security point of view resilience point of view because mm -hmm. robots don't get sick now if we automate everything we can automate and if we build uh, AI systems to to guess what people can do and to approve everything we can get approval for, and 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 essentially digitalize many things, there are huge chunks of the economy where people will do that for a living. Yeah. And then you say, well, what's going to happen to them? Future of uh, work. You know, yeah. Future of work, and this is a huge, huge issue. And if you to go back to your earlier question, I think this is going to be the issue, you know, as we come out of the crisis for the next three to five years together with environmental sustainability. But the, the deeper question is, you know, if, yes, you can go to a restaurant and you can have a touch screen and, and, and then the food runner brings out your, 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 your meal, you know, with no waiters involved. And mm. I don't really like that experience personally. <laughs> yeah. Now I'm 58 years old. So, so maybe that's my issue. I, I like the waiter who tells me the specials and, yeah. you know, and, and we talk about this and that, then that's part of, that's part of the experience for me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, if we automate all that stuff and we automate, the, if we automate the cars and the taxis and the, and the trucks, what, you know, there's a whole bunch of people who are going to lose their jobs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, it's quite a, it's really quite a, and, a, and, and it's whether it, this is going to fast track it in some way or push it forward even quicker is, is a really interesting question. You mentioned there as well uh, earlier about poor decision making and woeful leadership. I think we've seen, uh, some fairly uh, um, incredible examples of that um, in, in recent months. We don't need reminding about it, but um, how about sharing some examples of real leadership, that positive leadership that uh, we can learn from in the business arena or in public life that you've, you've witnessed? I, I, I mentioned, I mentioned O'Neill's, I think, I think he's just one of, of countless examples of, mm. of company leaders who, who did, you know, find a way forward to, to keep their people engaged, to do the right thing, and at the same time, take their company forward uh, through innovation. I think in the political realm, you know, the governor of New York State comes to mind. You know, they, they're facing this uh, tremendous outbreak in New York City, and he says, okay, there's, there's, there's a health crisis, and there's going to be a financial crisis. We'll deal with the health crisis first, and then we'll deal with the financial crisis when we have some space to do that. Yeah. Um, so I think you've seen a number of people kind of, kind of emerge as... as you know, what, what is real leadership? There's a guy from the Harvard Kennedy School uh, called Dean Williams, and he, his book is called Real Leadership. And, and what he talks about is, uh, you know, a real leader is authentic. They really care. They, 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 they understand that things are difficult. They explain to people the difficulties that we're facing. They paint a picture about the future that might be okay if everybody pulls through, and they communicate honestly with people about what's necessary to get there. You know, this, this is authentic and real leadership. This is very different than someone saying it's all going to be fine or it's all going to be doom and gloom or blame somebody else or, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and this is, and this you see, mm -hmm. you know, you see it when, when the CEO says, uh, no, no, you know, we, 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 we saw what was happening in China and we didn't react fast enough. And that's why we're in trouble rather than say somebody else made a mistake and here I am in, this, in, 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 in the mess, you know? So, so I, I think you, it's like, um, you know, you, you can see it when it's when it's real, 
and, and you can certainly see it when it's false. When it's not, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, very good. And and I as you say, like what, what you just described there just sounds so obvious and common sense and attractive. <laughs> why why it isn't uh, more prevalent in, in certain spaces, you you'd have to wonder. But anyway. You were um you, you, I saw one in one of your posts. You had a, a discussion with CEOs of, of Spanish companies with um, with your dean Franz Hoykamp, and yeah. uh, you mentioned in, in that that one of the CEOs had suggested an approach of now, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow, which I thought was quite uh, quite an interesting kind of. Can yeah, you explain? This was a guy. He runs a, a big automotive company, and you know they have uh, I think there are twenty seven different countries. So they saw this thing firsthand in China. And they and they've been reacting to it as it spread around the world. So for him, the now was was the crisis management was getting through the crisis, which had to do with managing liquidity, and, you know, keeping everybody safe, making sure that the business would have enough cash to open when it could open. That that was the now. Mm -hmm. The tomorrow was was opening up. The tomorrow was about um, you know, how we're going to open up here, there, exactly what we're going to do. Uh, you know, Schneider, for example, Schneider Electric, uh, they have two supply sources for most of the things in the world. So part of their, you know, now was to make sure, you know, moving supply from place to place. Uh, part of their tomorrow is figuring out which part of the world is going to open up sooner or later and how to move resources back and forth. Uh, the day after tomorrow is what we're talking about is where is everything going? Mm -hmm. You know, people are not going to stop going to business school in 2021. But the business schools of 2030 might look different than the ones that, that we have today. today. Yeah. So the day after tomorrow is really, you know, as people kind of absorb this whole thing and kind of get it through their heads, what will be important next? You know, if, if you're in the movie theater business, okay, it's been a really, really bad time to be in the movie theater business. Will there be a movie theater business? That's, that's, that's the day after tomorrow. Tomorrow. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there will be one, you know, in 2021. But you can you can imagine, you know, different scenarios for 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 the movie industry as we look as we look a little bit further out. So ha having that uh, dedicating some time to thinking about that now, or is that that for further down? Uh... No, I think I think the time the time for all three of those. Uh, I mean, what what uh, this gentleman was talking about is is he's doing those three different time frames in his head every day. Every day. Wow. And then he's and he's spending time on the now and he's spending time on tomorrow and he's spending time on the day after tomorrow. Uh, and, and it's probably just part of part of his his his, his way of organizing his head. Yeah. And um, well, it's great leadership too, to uh, yeah, not to yeah, be yeah. not to be caught in the now, which is what the, the tendency all of us face. You know. Yeah, well, so, well sometimes sometimes it, it is so absorbing that there is no 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 solution. Now, now the other thing I think, which a lot of leaders have seen during the crisis, is is you know the importance of their talent management system, and and if they do have a team which is strong enough to delegate to, this is where you see if if you know one one way to measure your people is to delegate to them and see if they fall over, you know, <laughs> and then in this case, you know only if you can delegate parts of the now, can you think about tomorrow and the day after. Yeah. So this has also been a test I think of the strength. And resilience of senior leadership teams. Yeah, very good, very good, and that's and that's that's something everyone can can test and and learn from, I suppose, and put the measures in place to address if it's not there. Well, I know you. I mentioned at the start you're you're a great advocate of a more sustainable model of of working and and living, and uh, we've the UN goals, as as you know, the essay of have are very much promoting as well for countries and organisations to reach. Do you think um, this is what we've just been through is in some ways going to drive us closer to those sustainability goals? Maybe delay? Well, I, 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 or... I, 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 I don't know if, you, if your technical wizards can do this, but I'd be interested in knowing what, what your people think. Okay. Because, uh, because I, think, I think we could even ask, we can ask everybody. Very good. Yeah, we have a poll here. Uh, thanks, okay. Alison, for popping that up. So. Will the recent pandemic spark a change in environmental sustainability in the business world? Likely, unlikely, or not at all. So if, if I, I think our, what you mean here, a change meaning more rather than less. Yes. <laughs> I hope. Much more, much more, yeah, potentially. Well, we've seen the benefit of in some ways, so hopefully we'll uh, 
but then there's a big cost to this as we know too isn't there there's this is the the challenge well i mean there there can be there cannot be a, a cost i mean that, that's the point and and just to be clear I, I i don't necessarily i mean i think we need to do more across the board but i don't think every company needs to do everything every company needs to understand where they are what business they're in who their stakeholders are who their employees are who their customers are and then think about what's the right environmental policy for them yeah. so i think it really depends you know what business you're in and then right. where you sit uh, i have a brother-in-law he's got 110 restaurants in the united states and you know he just obeys the law he doesn't do anything else okay. and, 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 and and there's nothing wrong with obeying the law you know obeying the law is is, is the law is the law of the land and it's yeah. it's the represent it is what civil society says they want I call that strategy, by the way, take the low road. I don't see anything wrong with it. There, there, there's, there's other strategies to go further. Uh, I can see your people seem to think that we will go further. Yeah, 87% uh, say it's likely and 13% and unlikely, but uh, nobody said not at all. So that's, Okay, well, that's, that's, yeah. that's interesting. And, and, and Ireland, of course, you know, I think it behooves Ireland to push more in this direction than any other direction because you know, the, the, the number one selling point for Irish uh, food products is it's, it's wonderful natural beauty. I mean, basically everything in the, in the country is almost organic. I mean, not quite, but, yeah. but you know, the, the grass-fed milk, grass-fed beef, um, uh, you know, the, the quality of the vegetables you produce is just, it's just astonishing. And, uh, and I think, that really plays to a, a interest in food safety and interest in food quality, which can can really set Ireland and is setting Ireland apart, in, especially in markets where, where food quality and food safety isn't so clear, like China. Mm. So I, I think this is something which which is it's close to 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 Ireland's heart. I mean, you know, when I went to the Cliffs of Moher with my my daughters, you know, the the, the natural beauty of Ireland is spectacular. It was so, it was clearly a sunny day, I imagine. <laughs> Uh, no, it wasn't. It was oh, still no. spectacular. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's ever a sunny day up there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> it, was still, it was still stunning. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, I, and I suppose like you, you mentioned there, it, it's not that every company has to do everything, but it's finding, finding the path, I suppose, learning in some ways as well from what, what we've experienced over the past number of months, finding a path that your company or your organization can take within the, uh, those sort of general goals and yeah well i think the other thing that a lot of companies have seen during the emergency is is when they you mentioned purpose earlier when the company was doing extraordinary things to help society you know turning the machines into making masks or turning the pizza I heard a story of a guy with a pizza oven turning it to just use it as a sterilizing machine you know crazy things like this um people have employees have have loved that Mm -hmm. Employees have, have felt good about their organization doing the right thing. And I think this, this idea of having purpose and putting purpose forward, and, and if that has to do with the sustainable development goals, the 17 goals the United Nations is, is, is trying to push forward for 2030 or, or some other thing, if you can have people feel that what the organization that they're working for is not only making money and providing whatever goods and services you provide, but has some deeper purpose, which is good. Yeah. I think you get, I think they, 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 they connect better. They, they work harder. They, they're more proud. They're proud when they talk to their children about what they're doing. You know, I think it just goes, goes exponentially better. Better. Everything. Um, now many firms, you know, to be, to be clear, have taken what they were doing anyway and matching them up to the, the UN 17 goals and making a nice brochure. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, if you're doing it anyway and you want to make it you know, clear, that's fine. Um, but I think it's, it's when, when, when it's really authentic, you know, when it really comes from someplace um, that makes sense, that's when I think it can really move things Much forward. more powerful. Yeah. Well, I might uh, just go to, to, I know we have a few questions lined up and if anyone wants to add, add any others, do put them in the Q&A box. But uh, Neil McKeown has uh, has a question that he'd like to uh, to put to you, Mike. If we can. Uh... Sure. He Hello, Neil. Live. Hey, Mike. How are you? Um, yeah. So I, I work for a company called New Era up here in the, in the north of Ireland. We're we're a 
a digital and IT services company uh, that doesn't sell all our customers' data. <laughs> 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 we, we develop digital solutions for, for our customers to help them improve the business. And since the yeah. start of the pandemic, we, we, we've transitioned to and been working on a distributed basis to service all of our customers pretty, pretty seamlessly, and it's been mostly successful. We've also had a few challenges in, in terms of leadership skills, and you touched on communication, but maybe develop a lose on a bit. What leadership skills do you think are most important to develop to allow us to successfully lead what's a fully remote services organization working with a fully remote customer base on a, on a totally distributed basis? Yeah, I, uh, Neil, so uh, it's a great question. I, I, I met some guys in San Francisco some years ago. They're called um, Automatic. They're the ones who publish WordPress. It's a mm -hmm. software for building websites. And they've been fully distributed for, I think, since the beginning. Um, I went to their old all-hands meeting, actually, in San Francisco with a group of students. And there were about 50 people in a room in San Francisco, another 500, you know, watching from everywhere else. And they even had little... Uh, um, iPads mounted on, on robot wheels, driving around oh. talking to people, little little robots so they could, you know, drive around some guys talking to you, hello, mm -hmm. you know. Um, I, I, think, I think that environment is tremendously stressful mm -hmm. because you've got to be on top of so many things. Uh, I'm, I'm sure this has been your experience of going from Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to Zoom meeting to conference call to conference call to Zoom meeting. Meanwhile, you know, you're your family's got issues and maybe something else is going on and you screwed up the time change. So you're actually booked twice. You know. Yep. Uh, um, all, all those things. All those things. And, and I think it requires tremendous discipline to, to, to be able to, to, to manage all that time management, to be able to time to, to manage that. And, and also, uh, and we talked about this earlier, we're, you know, Ron and I about how to make sure you don't lose the, the human contact. Um, and the and the spontaneity, so so that you know one of the things that people have told me about their their meetings on Zoom and, and through this this technology is they're much more efficient because everybody has the agenda in advance, everybody's got a complicated day, so we go through the points, bum 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 bum, and we're done in forty five minutes because everybody has another meeting to go to. That's wonderful, but it doesn't leave any time for saying hi Neil, uh, how how did your boy do in the rugby match? Which, yeah. which is also part of business. Mm -hmm. and, and it doesn't give any time to say, hey, by the way, while we're, we're here, I have a question to you about something completely unrelated. And sometimes new businesses or new ideas are born through that, you know, spontaneous conversations in the hallway, on the way to lunch, after the meeting, before the meeting. So, so I think part of it is discipline and structure and time management to make sure you get through these crazy days. But part of it is, is to have the imagination and the bandwidth to figure out ways to 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 encourage human contact, to care about people, and and find time and space for spontaneous things. I, I know one one organization which is doing you know digital cocktail hours, you know where people just literally five o'clock everybody goes down the fridge gets a beer and comes back up and chats. You know, <laughs> again, it, it, none of this is easy, and 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 some of this is strange. Um, the other thing I would recommend in the, in the new normal, though, even if you decide to go all distributed, to leave time in the budget and the and the calendar for some face-to-face -face stuff, whether it's monthly, bi-monthly, whether it's weekends, whatever, whatever it is, to make sure that because I, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm old, Neil, but I think you can maintain relationships well online, but I think it's hard to build trust from zero. Yeah, you you don't look much older than I do, right? So, so well, I, I hear you. You know, I, I think I think that's that's absolutely right. That's a great answer. You know, the, the the time management. I think you know that, that's kind of the first thing we've we've tackled and we've got pretty good at. And yeah, everybody feels that they're they're being a bit more productive and a bit more focused, particularly in meetings. And we've learned to give ourselves space between meetings, just even just in terms of thinking time. I think I think that that look the, the answer about the human touch. I think is is, is really nailed it for. For for me, you know, I, I just I had a one to one with, with one of my direct re reports earlier this morning, and and, and she and she's struggling with with this new working environment. But you know, I haven't for the last week taken the time out to talk to her and ask how she's getting on with with her with her children and and and, and with work and, and all those things. And we didn't really talk about work much for half an hour. We just talked about her and how she was getting on, and and you could see her mood visibly improving over the, over the course of half an hour. So I think it's a really good reminder to all of us yeah. to take the time to do that. 
Right. And it, it's, also little, it, it's also a little bit gender specific. And then, in fact, it was a, it was a lady manager who was explaining that she finally gotten some of her male colleagues to open up to her through this environment who, and, and, and they had never done so before. You know, so it's, 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 it's a complicated space, but I think it's something that has to happen. Has to happen. Very good. Okay. Well, well, we also have a question from Neve uh, O'Brien as well. Can, uh... Hi, Roland. Hi, Mike. How are you? I'm great. How are you? I'm very good. Thanks. Um, Mike, I know you've touched on a lot of maybe what's um, in my question um, in relation to the if scenarios and putting the three time frames in place and having a discussion about them. My question is in relation to um, growth. Um, and strategy. Um, while we all know that there will be a new normal in aspects of how we do business going forward, we just don't know like what the real economic fallout of COVID-19 will actually be over the next six to 18 months. So for companies whose strategies were to grow either nationally or internationally over those few years, what advice can you offer um, and how should strategies be adjusted? Yeah, and yeah it's, a, it's a great question because there's a lot of uncertainty and, and, yeah. and you know, one of the one of the uh, indication, one of the things that people normally do under uncertainty is, "Oh, this is uncertain, so I better not do anything." And yeah. I think that's, I think that's the wrong answer. Um, another one is to try to find information, and the problem with trying to find information is you're going to get contradictory information. You know, there there are people who say that, uh, you know, this is going to happen. People say that's going to happen. Um, what I would do is 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 get your leadership team together, look at the key markets key country by country that you're you're planning to grow in maybe get some outside people who who have a different point of view but really make your own mind up about what you think is going to happen um you know do you think europe is going to get this sorted do you think the united states is going to stay in the stuck for as long as we can imagine you know, and make your own judgment about which of the markets do you think are higher risk than others a, a simple way to do this is with um with uh, fly, uh, traffic lights you know, so if you say the uh, uh, United States is not one market for most Irish companies, it's 50 markets or, or, or at least 20, you know, the East Coast, West Coast, South, North, you know, traffic lights. So the East Coast of the United States, is it yellow or is it going to be green? Um, California, yellow, red, green. Uh, Germany, uh, Germany, I was going to say green, but lately it's starting to look more yellow because I think they just locked down uh, one, one of the parts of the country. Yeah. Uh, Spain, I would say, was probably green because we're going to open up this country, yes or yes. Uh, I think everybody's, uh, so, but I would go through the, the, the analysis yourselves and kind of kind of put some priorities and, and say, you know, because one thing is what we think is going to happen. The other is how sure are we of that information? Yeah, it's kind of like a moving face really and will be. Yeah. Um, where to, where but, but, to but I would trust, I would trust your own judgment to some degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would go through a, I would do it carefully and, and slowly, but I would get the team together in a couple hours and kind of go market by market. And, yeah. and, and, and agree where you agree, agree where you disagree, maybe agree where you need more data. But if the collective wisdom is, I think these three markets are pretty sure that they're going to be fine, and those are much more uncertain, then maybe we move resources to those which are we're more sure about. Yeah. For some companies, it will be very much um, sitting down maybe and really assessing the market they're going after in the first place. Is it actually still there? what other opportunities have come from COVID that's related to what we want to do or what are, what's absolutely completely new. But it's, it seems like it's, it's, it will take time and as you say, to actually um, assess it bit by bit and make it as informed as possible. But the absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I once heard a guy from the advertising industry and he was talking about advertising and he's talking about how to get a good advertisement. And, but, but, but his basic message was that human needs don't change that much needs of belonging, uh, the desire to be loved, you know, these fundamental human values. And, and I think if you look at the products and services you're making and the, and, and the businesses that you're planning to grow, if you can tie them back to authentic human needs of people or companies, you know, whether it's B2C or B2B or, or to the government, and, and you say, well, you know, people will need to do this anyway. This is gonna happen yes or yes. So we're gonna be there. Um, this maybe people aren't going to need to do anymore because it might go away, you know, and, and uh, Ronan mentioned environmental sustainability. You know, I, my conviction is we will move to a lower carbon society. Yes or yes. It's just a matter of time because yeah, the world needs, needs to do it. And, you know, if we don't do it politically sooner, the climate's going to get worse and we're going to have to do it anyway. Um, 
So there are some things which, which are just going to stay. So, so if you can tie whatever you want to do into kind of basic things, then, then the, the delivery mechanism might change, the, the retail structure might change, but the fundamental needs won't change. And I think if you can tie yourself to some of those things, you should be okay. Should be okay. Very good. Very good. Well, you, you were talking there about markets. If I could just ask a question about, uh, I know looking at a country by country is, is an important uh, approach, but with the EU as a single market and so forth, um, we've seen it struggle with solidarity and, and unity over these past few months. And just today they're debating about opening up the, the, uh, the borders and lifting travel restrictions. But, you know, state interests come to come to the fore and we've seen that do you think it will hold together as a single market or was brexit um, the beginning yeah i mean i i i think it will uh Ron. I, mean, I think that the the european project has different levels to it and and i think what many people forget especially people you know our age and younger is 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 europe was devastated by war two times in the last century and, and, and war between Germany and France right now is not really part of the story. And, and you know, why does Poland want to be part of Europe? Why does everybody want to be part of Europe? Because it's, it's this amazingly peaceful place. And, you know, we need peace and peace and prosperity are linked together. And, and people forget that. So, so you know, why, why is England leaving? Well, because of, because of Maastricht, because of, because of all the other European rules, which, which were added to the, the, the common market. So I think that the common market is, is, is not really in danger. Even after Brexit, I think there will be some kind of a trade deal between England and the rest of the, of the continent. The, the, it's, it's Brussels and its regulations, which might get watered down over time. So there's been this debate for years about a broader Europe, which is shallower, or a tighter Europe, which has deeper uh, harmonization of laws. Maybe that deeper harmonization of laws might slow down a bit but i don't think anything is going to stop the the broad mm -hmm. european participation um you know in, in, a, in, a, in an irish context you know you know the european union has been a blessing for ireland the yeah. good friday agreement would have been possible without without the european overlay you know and and and, and, and nobody wants to go back i mean nobody i know in ireland wants to go back to the troubles nobody I know in Europe wants to go back to, to you know, a, a world which was, uh, which was divided. Yeah. So, so I think that that is the underlying thing now. From a from a coordination mechanism, you know, yes, it was a mess. But when you know, you know, when you had tens of thousands of people dying in Spain and Italy, people get scared. Mm -hmm. So you think that might be a short term reaction rather than. Well, I mean, we might get border controls. We might get more border controls. We might get, you know, we might slow down in some of the, some of the most um, ambitious aspects of the European project. But I think some of the basic aspects will stay the same. Will stay the same. Very good. Very good. Well, we we better uh, wrap it up. I've I've one last question to to uh, pose to you. Just knowing, I suppose the many of us have been spared the worst, um, and there's the the question really of of um, the spirit of service that I know we promote both in Yesse and in Timony as well. It's one of the values that, that we encourage in, in uh, through our programs for, for leaders to take, embark on themselves. Do you, do you see that as being something that, uh, you know, we could give back as leaders more in this way, greater solidarity? Well, I mean, you asked a question about the kind of people that, that kind of shown through the crisis. And I, I think you've seen people with a tremendous spirit of service mm -hmm. behind every corporate success story has been someone doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. I think that's the character story. That's the O'Neill story. That's uh, so many other stories. And, and, and uh, this whole talk, this whole issue about, you know, reaching out to your people to make sure they're okay. Mm -hmm. Because, because really, you know, you, well, you're the boss, but you're also, you know the boss is responsible for their people, and 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 and, and needs to give service to them, which is to, to make sure they're okay. You know, so I think this 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 comes 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 right around. Uh, the only other message, the other thing I think, which is really important in this whole crisis, and it gets at this issue, is it has not been lived equally by everybody. So you know I feel tremendously blessed because in, in you know in our house we have plenty of room, two different Wi-Fi servers, a small garden, you know. <laughs> 
and 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 in no time during this crisis was there any question that there's enough money in the bank for food in the fridge. Yeah. And 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 not everybody had that experience. No. Um, you know, people with small children in small apartments have suffered just because it's just hard to keep the kids entertained and keep the keep going at, at work. Uh, people in the lower end of the economic spectrum in the developed countries have had a much, much more difficult time than, than wealthier people. And, and we're seeing now that in many of the developing countries around the world, they don't have what the experts call the policy space or normal people would call the money to, to lock people up. You know, they, they, they just don't have the resources to, 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 to Support you know, people. provide things. So, so people are at risk. And, and I think to get at the spirit of service, it's when somebody understands that in their organization and is reaching out to people to make sure they're okay, to keep people on the payroll or to go through whatever government uh, systems are in place. Um, and if you have to lay people off temporarily to make sure they're getting their checks from the government, calling them up to check on all this kind of stuff is I think is, I think is what has really set some people apart from others. Great. Well, that's a great note to uh, to end on. Thank you very much, Mike, for joining us here in Ireland and sharing your your insights this evening. Really do hope we can have you back in uh, in Ireland in person soon. Well, I hope you open up that beautiful building of yours in downtown Dublin. I mean, that's, yeah. that's a, it's a yeah, beautiful yeah, site. Well, it is, isn't it? Clare Street. Yeah. Well, we'll we'll have you back there uh, soon again, hopefully. And um, well, just to to say, we started these webinars um, on leadership in an extraordinary time back at the end of March to help our alumni through the course of the lockdown. And now that the, the, the lockdown phases are, are well advanced, we're going to finish up this series and no better one to finish it on than with, uh, with Mike Rosenberg. So I'd like to say a big thank you to all of our alumni and faculty who've shared their experiences and insights over these past three months with us. Uh, it's been a very challenging period as, as Mike just pointed out there for many families and for leaders of, of organizations. Indeed, the next three months ahead are going to be important ones um, as we take steps towards, towards recovery. So here at Timoney, we'll continue to provide shorter webinars and content uh, to help you with those challenges and uh, some of the, the painful decisions that need to, be, need to be taken and to help you lead in, in the most uh, effective way with, with that spirit of service uh, that Mike uh, talked about so eloquently there. So thank you very much. And in the meantime, take care.